Durga Pujo can easily be called the greatest show on earth. Not just in Kolkata, Bengal or India. This festival is now celebrated all over the world. Riding on its diversity of concepts, broad artistic canvas, the spontaneous participation of people and its religious inclusivity, Durga Pujo has transcended geographical barriers with ease. The UNESCO intangible cultural heritage tag given to Kolkata's Durga Pujo has made the festival even more global. The significance of Durga Pujo in the lives of Bengalis can't be overemphasized. This is their biggest festival worth the year-long wait. Mother Goddess arrives as the harbinger of peace and prosperity to destroy all evil forces that plague us and establish the order of good over evil irrespective of race caste or religion people throng the streets in thousands to celebrate this festival of happiness together A dip into history books would reveal that Devi Durga used to be worshipped during spring several hundred years ago in the month of Chaitra. This spring festival, commonly known as Bashunti Pujo, is said to have been started by Rar Bengal's King Surat, whose capital was today's Bolpur. This Bashunti Pujo which began in the ancient times is believed to be the actual Durga Pujo. However, mythology has it that Ram performed Durga Pujo in autumn with an eye to defeating Ravana. It has gained currency all over as an autumnal festival only with perhaps Ramachandra's Okal Bodhon as the starting point. The debate over how it started still rages, but there's enough evidence that kings and zamindars played a pivotal role in launching the Durga Pujo. The preparations commence from the Rathayatra itself. The puja of a royal family or a zamindar house begins with the worship of the idol's structure. After immersion, the structure is retrieved from the water and purified during the next Rathajatra. Nowadays, the community pujas have switched to Khunti Pujo or worshipping a bamboo pole which is later used in the pandal construction. This ritual is usually performed between Bengali New Year's Day and August 15th, sometimes on Rathayatra Day. That's when the Kumatuli Potuapara start getting busy.
The history of Kolkata and Bengal's Pujo is ancient. The earliest Durga Pujo recorded in the city is perhaps that of the Shaborno Roy Choudhury family in Borisha, which started in 1610. Subsequently, the family split and now there are seven pujas in all. However, the Jamindar house or Royal Palace Puja kicked off in Bengal after the Battle of Plassey with the beginning of the British colonial regime in 1757. That is when Maharaja Krishna Chandru, the king of Krishnanagar, started his royal palace pujo. In the same year, King Nabukrishnadev began his Durga Pujo at the Shobha Bajar royal palace. Following his model, Durga Pujo became a status symbol for the wealthy clans of Kolkata and Bengal. It became a platform to showcase one's riches and influence and to gratify the British with a raft of entertainment programs. The Shobha Baja Royal Palace Pujo was graced by Lord Clive and later Lord Benting, Lord Cornwallis and others. The thought behind such lavish spending was to keep Goddess Durga and her family happy since she comes home only for those four days a year. Following in the footsteps of Nabukrishna Dev, the Andul Royal Palace Pujo was started in Howrah in 1770 in the presence of Lord Clive. The same year, the Chatubabu Latubabu Pujo began in Kolkata. Swimming against the tide, Rani Rashmuni started her own pujo at her Jan Bajar residence in 1790. With the focus on the locals, not the British. Over time, the pujos at the Zamindar houses gained currency and myriad tales of folklore, divine diktats, and so on got intertwined with the history of these pujos. Luminaries like Raja Rammohan Rai, Ishwar Chandra Vidya Shagur, Rabindranath Thakur, De Rosio and Vivekanando used to grace these pujos. All that is history today. With time, these pujos later morphed into community pujos. It all started in 1790 in Hooghly's Guptipara, where 12 friends came together to start a community, Jagodhatri Pujo. Another form of Goddess Durga. This is how the word Barowadi or 12 together was coined and became synonymous with community Durga Pujos across Bengal. The first Barowari Pujo of Kolkata was started at the Dharmut Shohini Shobha in Bhobanipur in 1910. This was the first instance of a community Durga Pujo being held out in the open for all and sundry to enjoy and participate in. Not only is Durga Pujo Bengal's biggest festival, it is also inextricably linked to the lives and culture of the Bengalis.
the preparations begin months ahead with a clutch of different people from all walks of life getting involved. From artist to artisan, day wagers to business people and myriad other professions thrown in. This great festival is a grand alchemy of the efforts of all these people. It all starts with the arrival of clay and water, the two main ingredients for creating the idol. Also required are jute fiber and sticks, straw, wooden blocks, pieces of cloth, bamboo, dyes, chalk and pin sticks. The first step is to prepare the clay well and get it ready. One must knead it well while mixing water all the time using both hands and feet. The kneading must continue till the clay is soft enough. Then, using small pieces of straw, clay and water, an amalgam of muddy mould is created. Simultaneously, the skeleton is prepared from wood and bamboo pieces. First, the scaffolding is built. Then, the wood and bamboo pieces are wrapped with straw. Bit by bit, the straw skeleton of the idol takes shape. Once the inner structure is ready, the painstaking work of layering it with clay, water and straw begins. The artist continues this process so that he can arrive at that magical shape he has in his mind's eye. The face of the goddess is made from black or kumar clay, while Aloya clay is also used. These days, the artists use dices to chip away at the clay figure to chisel out the final details on the idol's face. Jute and Kumar clay are used to create the digits of the idols. This is how gradually all the idols take shape. The idols are then dried in the sun. This is how the artist's skilled hands create the first look of the idols. There's a history behind the creation of Kumatuli or the Potuapara. After its victory in the Battle of Plassey in 1757, the British East India Company focused on establishing colonial rule in this region. The company decided to build Fort William 
in Gobindopur village and all the villagers were relocated to Shutanuti. As per the advice of the company directors, John Decania Holwell allotted different zones in the city to the employees. Accordingly, the various native regions of Kolkata got dissected into neighborhoods denoted by profession. Hence the birth of localities like Shuripara, Kolutola, Chuturpara, Ahiritola, Kumatuli and others. Towards the end of the 19th century, as Bada Bazaar continued to expand, the clay artisans began leaving the city in numbers. However, the clay modelers of Kumatuli, who used Gonga Mati or clay from the river to mold earthen pots and sold them in the Shutanuti market, which is today Bada Bazaar, stayed back. Later on, they started crafting idols for the pujas of the city's wealthy families. As the concept of Baruari or community pujas kicked in, this puja committee began ordering their idols from the Kumatuli clay modelers. These artists had mostly traveled to Kolkata from the regions of Krishnanagar, Shantipur and Ranaghat of Nodia district in search of a livelihood and King Krishnachandra of Nodia had a significant role behind this. In later years, many clay artists have come from the then East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, to work in Kumatuli and have stayed on. When it comes to idol making in Bengal, primarily, two ancient styles are followed. The Bishnupur style and the Kongshonarayan style. Most idol artists adhere to either of these two schools of design. The practice of crafting idols out of clay instead of stone or eight metals had started many years ago. This process was pioneered by two kings of Bengal. Mollo King Jagat Mollo of Bishnupur in the Bakura district of West Bengal and Kongsho Narayan from Tahirpur in Rajshahi district of East Bengal, now Bangladesh. Between the two of them, they introduced two distinctive styles of idol crafting. In 997 AD, Jagat Mollo started the Bishnupur style in Rar Bengal by getting the idol in his own temple made with that approach. Subsequently, the Bishnupur style became popular with most of the royal palaces across Bakura district adopting this method. However, its popularity remained confined to Bakura and Rar Bengal compared to the more universally accepted Kongshonarayan style. In the Bishnupur style, Kartik and Ganesh are positioned on the upper half of the structure and Lakshmi and Saraswati on the lower part. Instead of the backdrop painting or Chal Chitra, Lord Shiva adorns the structure along with his disciples Nandi and Bringi. In the Rar region, it is not unusual to find only the face of Goddess Durga instead of the whole figure. The Kongsho Narayan style gained rapid currency across Bengal with Maharaj Krishna Chandra of Nodia being hugely instrumental in spreading this design approach. Here, Lakshmi and Saraswati occupy the top half of the backdrop, with Kartik and Ganesh positioned in the bottom half. The backdrop has a half moon Chal Chitra with Mahadev and ten great learnings depicted on the Chali or canvas which is usually referred to as the Bangla Chali. The distinctive features of the Bangla Mook Durga face 
include beautifully drawn large eyes, parrot beak-like nose, and slightly tapered cheeks, all painted in a deep shade of amber. The idol at the Krishnanagar Royal Palace is still made in this heritage style, as are most other Zamindar house and Royal Palace puja idols across the state. However, many pujas have introduced their own variations and myriad tweaks to the conventional style have surfaced in different regions. In recent times, of course, the concept of theme puja has become overwhelmingly popular with the theme artists flooding the organizers with a raft of creative ideas that manifest on the face of the goddess. At Kumatuli, once the final details of the idol have been etched out, work begins to maintain the smoothness and accuracy of the creation. Day turns into night and night back into day as the idol artists stay immersed in providing the final touches to their cherished creations before they pick up the paintbrush. The monsoons give way to autumn and its sparkling skies as another domain of Pujo art. Pandal erection work begins in most paras with bamboo poles and strings. With the advent of theme pujo, pandal making has also deviated a lot from the traditional bamboo and cloth structures. To reflect the creative ideas of the artist, the pandals are also a medium of expression. Nowadays we see the abundant use of other materials like iron, aluminium, cement, glass, and a host of other stuff as well as various elements from Bengal's folk art in the pandal making. Outside Potuapara, there are many artists who light up the Durga Pujo carnival with their brilliant creations. One such seat of magical art is Bongkapashi, a village near Katua in East Burdwan district. That is really the dressing room of the Mother Goddess. Here families have been engaged in creating ornaments and embellishments for Devi Durga for generations. The ornaments are mainly made of shola, a milky white plant with a spongy pith. The main ingredient is extracted from the bunches of shola and then used with rare dexterity to craft out magnificent embellishments for the goddess using glue and colors. These ornaments are used by artists in Kumatuli and other idol-making communities to decorate Mother Durga and her children. The tale of Pujo trinkets would remain incomplete without a mention of Dompara on Ramesh Dattu Street, Kolkata. 
home to a major ancillary enterprise, Tukumatuli. The skilled artists of Nompara, through generations, have been creating the bamboo and cane embellishments and other paraphernalia required for the pujo, which is a work of unmatched splendor. And Dompara has become a worthy cousin of Kumatuli that comes alive for the festive season. Meanwhile, the Kumatuli idol artists begin putting color on clay. Stroke by stroke, myriad hues brighten up Devi Durga as she takes her final shape. The color and gaiety infects everybody and the impatient wait for the festivities begin. Mother Goddess is coming to alleviate all our miseries. This had actually become the emblem of our freedom movement. In the early 20th century, post the Bengal partition movement, the celebration of Durga Pujo underwent a significant shift and the role of the mother goddess got a whole new narrative. During that juncture, the clarion call to rise against the British was heard all across Bengal and the responsibility to fight against British rule was that of the sons of Mother Goddess, the freedom fighters. Gandhiji's call to do away with untouchability morphed into the concept of the community puja with participation of people from all castes and creeds. Vrindavan Matri Mundir started in 1910 in North Calcutta. Bhag Bajar started in 1919 was a major example of Durga Pujo creating a platform for freedom fighters. Atindranath Bosch and Pulin Bihari Dash both having a history with the Onushilon Shomiti founded Shimla Bam Shomiti in 1926. Durga Puja was started in the same year and inaugurated by Shubhash Chandra Bosch, who himself celebrated Durga Puja a year earlier while he was in Mandalay Jail in erstwhile Burma. Many royal palaces with their pujas lent a platform to the freedom fighters like the Ombika Nagar Rajbari of Bakura. Goddess Durga became the symbol of strength and divinity who would rescue the nation from colonial rule. Today, when we see the throng of people during Durga Puja from all religions, castes, color, language and nationality, it seems this is perhaps the only global festival in this whole world that can bring people together with its inherent inclusivity. A shining example of this harmony is Parbhutipur village in Howrah district. This is where people from the minority communities are all involved in creating the hair of the goddess and of her children, Mohishashur and also the lion's mane. The hair artists follow a specific method with the main ingredient being jute fiber, which usually comes from the hoogli. The jute fiber is immersed in boiling water with black dye 
mixed in it. And then spread out to dry in the sun. Idle hair is made from the dried jute fiber. Curly hair is created by wrapping softer and thinner fiber around jute stems which are left aside for some time. Lord Shiva's grey hair is crafted from the uncolored fiber. The same technique is used to create the lion's mane or the red hair on Shiva's head. Ma Durga embodies a variety of images. On one side, she symbolizes victory of good over evil by defeating Mahishasura, while on the other, she appears before us as the panacea for all our miseries. At the same time, she is the emblem of woman power and emancipation. Durga Pujo started at Belur Mot in 1901. Swami Vivekananda started the Pujo with the image of the Goddess and was faced with a lot of difficulties and criticism. One of the main reasons behind this initiative of Swami Vivekananda was to institutionalize the respect for the divinity of motherhood. The worship of Goddess Durga as mother, especially the Kumari Pujo at Belur Mot, was started to create an awareness of the potential of the divinity of women and to foster an attitude of respect towards them. Kumar Tuli continues to gear up to welcome Ma Durga, working at feverish pitch. The goddess is decked in her sari, jewelry and embellishments. While work on the idols is on in full swing, the pandal makers are busy providing finishing touches to the intricate interiors. It's a magic menagerie of various designs and concepts. The influence of Durga Pujo in the social discourse of Bengalis is immense. A lot of art and literature is created around this Pujo season. Pujo Gan or Pujo songs is very much an inextricable part of the festivities. A clutch of iconic Bengali songs are unveiled around the Pujos over the years. There is a similar thread running through literary outputs inspired by the Pujos. From little magazines to small and large publishers, everybody seems to be bringing out a Pujo edition of literary offerings. Many Bengali films are also released during the festivities. And of course, Ma Durga manifests herself through the paintbrush of the artist. New clothes for the festival are a must, while various restaurants woo diners with a lavish and mouth-watering spread of Pujo special dishes. They are all part and parcel of celebrating Durga Pujo. The Pujo period also provides a huge boost to the region's economy. For thousands of people, this is the sole source of their entire year's income, like the Bir Shippur village. 
The people of Birshippur village in Howrah district have been counting the days to the festivities. The village has the onerous task of arming Devi Durga that is providing the ten weapons for her ten hands. Using tin and aluminium, the villagers of Birshippur handcraft the weapons of the goddess. From the trident to the thunder to the spinning wheel projectile, the club and the like. Ma Durga is adorned with her weapons in the last stage of her decoration. So Birshippur is now buzzing with activity. Soon the much awaited day arrives, the day of Mohalla, which marks the beginning of Devi Pokko, or the fortnight of the goddess after the end of Pitri Pokko. Everybody wakes up at dawn, listening to the mesmerizing baritone of the legendary Virendra Krishna Bhadra chanting the hymns of Mohaloya. It's a magical feeling as one can smell Pujo in the air with the strains of Agomuni music. The moment of Chokkudan arrives. The goddess is transformed from Rinmoi to Chinmoi or the blissful. Mother Goddess begins her journey from Kumatuli to the various community puja panels and household pujos where she will be installed. These days, even before the ritual unveiling of Ma Durga or Shushti, people start thronging the pandals in their thousands. Attracted by the innovative concepts introduced by the theme artists, very much the norm of the time. The concept of theme pujo or differential thinking in terms of artistic presentation of the festival started way back in 1961 at Jagat Mukherjee Park, pioneered by young artist Ashok Gupto. 
He was the first to abandon the cloth and bamboo model of pandal making and used a myriad of murals instead. This was the first deviation from the traditional. But the theme Pujo started gaining significant traction across Kolkata after 2000. Now, this is the focus of attraction for the masses. Mahashushti arrives after the long wait. The sixth day of Baby Pokko is known as Mahashushti. This day marks the formal beginning of Durga Pujo. Along with activities, the Pujo rituals begin this day. Odhibash symbolizes sanctifying the stay of the goddess Durga in the Pujo Pandal. Amuntron signifies the invitation of Goddess Durga. Kolparambho marks the beginning of the Pujo. And Bodhon is the consecration of the Durga idol. In other parts of India, the sixth day of Navaratri is also celebrated as Durga Shushti. In fact, Durga Pujo and Navaratri are similar festivals celebrated in different ways across the nation. Both festivals signify the removal of darkness and the victory of good over evil. Moha Shaptami, the second day of the festival. One of the significant rituals of the seventh day of the Durga Pujo is the bathing of the Kolabu. The ceremonial bath is given to a banana tree which is draped in a white sari with a red border with some shidur or vermilion smeared on its leaves. In some royal houses of Bengal, Kolabo, the symbolic representation of nine types of leaves or Nobuputrika is taken to the Ganga in a spectacular procession on a palanquin. After the bath, the tree is kept on the side of Ganesha. Shaptami Pujo begins after the bathing of the Kolabo. In the royal and zamindar houses, rituals and festivities become one as people immerse themselves in the unbridled joy of celebrating Durga Pujo. Everybody is happy, blessed with the evening Aruti and Ma Durga's fathomless love. The morning of Mohashtami begins with Pushpanjali or the offering of flowers to the goddess. This is the day when Devi Durga will slay the Mahishasura demon. So prayers to the goddess begin early with the Pushpanjali as devotees observe a fast till the flower offering.
The offering of bhog to Devi Durga is another significant ritual of Mahashtami. Across royal and zaminda houses, the practice of offering bhog to the goddess from Shushti to Dashami is an age-old custom. The nature of bhog offering varies from day to day, pujo to pujo, across various regions, with the constituents ranging from fruits and vegetables to fish and meat, different varieties of rice, sweetmeats and other items. Time elapses till the auspicious hour of Shondi Pujo arrives. Last 24 minutes of Ashtabi and the first 24 minutes of Nabhavi. This 48 minutes is the sacred interlude when Devi Durga slays Mahishasura, symbolizing the victory of good over evil. The crowd swell as the night progresses and people of all ages from all walks of life join in the festivities with spontaneous gaiety. After the euphoria of the Ashtami night comes Namumi. The Pujo reaches its last leg. A number of community pujo organizers and even household pujos celebrate Kumari Pujo or the worship of the maiden following the path illuminated by Swami Vivekananda. Kumari Pujo symbolizes the worship of the goddess in the form of worshipping an unmarried teenage girl. A maiden is the early symbol of womanhood or nature in this ritual. The Universal Mother symbolically appears in the shape of a maiden. On the last day of the Durga Pujo, the boundless joy and gaiety of the revelers crash onto the streets like a powerful flood smashing old barriers. The Dhunuchi dance to the rhythm of the Dha and the combined cadence of the conch shells and drum bells render the air with festive fervor from the big city to the remote villages. Kolkata's Durga Pujo is probably the only street art festival of this magnitude in the entire world. That too spread across several days which attracts interest and visitors from not only other parts of India, but from all around the world. All the marvelously creative and original themes conceptualized by the artists and ritual architects and the magnificent renditions by the craftspeople go on to create a form of high art of ethereal beauty. The euphoria of Durga Pujo comes to an end with the arrival of Dashami. The fervor and the trance subside as the time comes to say goodbye to the goddess. Goddess Durga, along with her children, will leave for her heavenly abode in Mount Koilash. A sense of melancholy hangs heavy in the air. Time comes, but they be born. It is a ritual with vermilion, sweets and other items, usually performed by married women to bid farewell to Devi Durga and wish her a safe journey back. They circle the idol and perform the ritual applying Shidur on the forehead of the goddess and offering her sweets.
After that, the women, mostly decked up in red and white saris, smear sindoor on each other's forehead and bangles. On this same day of Bijaya Doshami, the Sera is also observed with a lot of passion all over the country. While Bengalis immerse the idol in the river, people in the north and in western India burn effigies of Ravan to celebrate the victory of Lord Rama. Here in Bengal, the idol is taken to the Ganga or to any other river or water body with a colourful procession of people. Once Ma Durga reaches the ghat, she is slowly taken to the water's edge. It is a symbolic gesture of safe transit of the goddess to heaven, as believed by the Hindu. Eventually, the immersion happens, and that puts an end to all the rituals and festivities. The wait begins for another year for goddess Durga to bless us all with her presence.